My thesis is if there's a no vote and it's viewed as a no confidence vote, if Elon's playing 4D chess, I think this is like the, the obvious 4D chess move for Elon. Yeah. He announces he's leaving the company. Yeah. Within a month, the AI engineers are gone because they have so many opportunities. Mm -hmm. And the stock, and then all of a sudden the market realizes, wait, like people like me, I, like if Elon leaves the company, I'm out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm selling it all. Right. Welcome to next week's future. I'm honored to have um, Warren Redlick here with me. You want to talk about the shareholder vote? Sure. Let's talk about shareholder vote. Because I, I think this becomes irrelevant if the shareholders vote no. I think if the shareholders, and I'm not, this is my thesis. Um, and for those of your viewers who haven't seen me talk about this, um, I have become concerned that there's a risk the shareholders might vote no. Mm -hmm. And I ballpark after conversations with a few people, I think it's around a 20% risk, a 20% chance that the shareholders vote no. I'd like to say it's a higher risk, a lower risk, but I, I think it's a reasonable estimate. I think, I think we are seeing institutional shareholders have less holding in the company than they used to, but I think institutional shareholders are more likely to no, vote no than last time. Mm -hmm. um, that's a long conversation. And then it's a hard, I just don't have a gauge for how retail shareholders are going to vote. And then with employee stock or former employee stock, like how's Zach Kirkhorn going to vote? I don't know. Zach Kirkhorn owns a lot of stock, I think. How's Drew Baglino going to vote? I think they're going to vote yes, but I don't know. Um, are some of the former employees who got laid off going to be jaded and they're going to vote no? I don't know. So my feeling is that if shareholders vote no on Elon's compensation package, it will be viewed as a no confidence vote and Elon might leave Tesla and would radically alter the future of Tesla. Because so, I think if, sorry, if yes. Elon, if my, just to finish the thesis, because this is quick, if yes. Elon leaves the company, I think the AI engineers leave the company and it is no longer an AI and robotics company. It becomes a car company and an energy company, which is fine, but that's a hundred billion dollar market cap company, not a trillion dollar market cap company. So I understand the risks around the vote because th those votes are from shareholders. Some of them, like Leo Koguan, are uh, thinking right and and could and are voting against it, which ha has a risk. I don't think that Elon gives up on Tesla just because there's a no vote uh, on his pay, pay, pay package because you know, or for the the Texas um, relocation. That if either of those things drop, that they'll come back again and try again with another vote in a, in a few months. It will. They'll see what the issues are, and then they will do that. The other thing is that, you know, Elon is tenacious, and basically his money, uh, in terms of like his wealth, is increasingly, you know, the more Tesla has has issues and the the SpaceX, you know, June 6th could launch and get fully reusable. It's already valued at $200 billion. If they land, take the landing on that in, in the June one or July one, you know, August, that SpaceX valuation shoots up, especially with, with Starlink. And then they're they're having the, the direct to mobile. The XAI he valued at $24 billion with a $6 billion raise, making a Grok 2. If, if they make Grok 2 and it's even GPT-4, and or a Grok 3, the GPT-5 level, which could be, you know, perhaps by the end of the year, a GPT-4 superior uh, thing would then, I think, give them a valuation of $80 billion, $100 billion, just like OpenAI. And then Elon has half of that. So Elon, the money situation is fine, and he will have the patience to fix the votes on Tesla, especially if the, you know, August 8th, the, the deal announcement, you know, things start moving forward on FSD. The, the price goes up, everyone's happy with the stock. And then if Tesla stayed cheap, below a trillion dollars, and um, SpaceX, I think, will be worth, you know, a trillion, two trillion dollars by the end of next year, based on the um, Starlink deployments and going direct to cell phones, that kind of thing, having 50 million Starlink customers making $100 billion, that would be at a high profit margin of like, you know, maybe 60 billion, you know, uh, 50 multiple would put them three trillion, you know, even less, you know, like let's say um, 40 billion dollars in profit at 50 multiple could give them a two trillion dollar valuation with a lot of strong customers. So then he would use the piggy bank of Starlink to do a quick IPO, get 100 billion dollars. Then he can buy his 
Tesla shares and whatever, and basically flip the bird at at the Delaware thing because it's like I bought I buy the shares. I was gonna. He said he would buy back his shares anyway, but basically he could. Is not may not be fully optimal, you know, in terms of his his money that way. But it's kind of like, you know, he said, "Don't try and threaten me with money," because he'll have so much from each of the the four major companies, and then Neuralink later. But you know, in the next year or two, it's SpaceX that's, that's rip going to rip, uh, XAI going to rip, and then if he gets the payments sorted out for X, where it makes the PayPal type system and banking and that kind of stuff. Um, that also works, and, and then Starlink and um, and cell phones and uh, and X work together to get more people um, using it. Although there are already six hundred million users, so going to just with normal growth, better services, they can get to a billion. But then with payments, they'd be a bigger payment system. If they, if everyone who has X gets um, X payments. They can be bigger than PayPal, which then again shoots them up to two hundred billion dollars, which would then be again Elon owns half of that, so he'll have the means to throw around ten billion dollars. And the fact that a corrupt judge took fifty billion dollars from him if this thing doesn't go through on the first vote, I think he would then say, "I can wait. I got a hundred billion, a few hundred billion dollars elsewhere. I will then." try again one on the texas move and then two so here's on... the problem with that number one yeah. um so I, I mean i think there's a lot of but let me let me let me just ask you really quick you're mr prediction yes what do you think the probability is of a no vote i, I don't worry about the texas move i think that's probably going to fail what's yeah. your probability of a no vote on elon's compensation package i'm uh thinking it's it's less than 10%. I think that there's enough of the um other institutions they have on board that they that they've yeah, I I think it's less than 10%. I think it is maybe 10%. I think I'm more confident that the vote was going to pass. Cuz here's my 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 thesis is if there's a no vote and it's viewed as a no confidence vote, if Elon's playing 4D chess, I think this is like the the obvious 4D chess move for Elon. Yeah. He announces he's leaving the company. Yeah. Within a month, the AI engineers are gone because they have so many opportunities mm -hmm. and the stock. And then all of a sudden the market realizes, wait, like people like me, I, like if Elon leaves the company, I'm out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm selling it all. Right. I understand. Because I, I see a future where, I mean, I'll describe the future I see, but I, you know, to me, Tesla as a car and energy company is great, but it's a hundred billion dollar market cap and that's, you know, $30 share price. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. I'd rather get out at 170 or whatever it's going to be after the vote than, than wait to see it fall to 30. So if the stock price does fall to 30 or $40 a share, which would take time, but if Elon's patient and Elon is patient, he lets the stock price fall to 30 or $40 a share. And then he puts together and people say this is impossible, but we're talking about Elon. Um, he puts together a, a pack, a group of investors and takes Tesla private at 60, at $69 a share would be perfectly fitting. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. he could come in and do a hostile takeover or a friendly takeover at $69 a share. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you were a shareholder holding at 180 mm -hmm. and you get bought out at $69 a share, that's not a win for the sh retail shareholders. It's a win for Elon. Mm -hmm. But the ability for him to take the money that he accumulates, and I think it takes a year for this to fall out, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and the, my concern on this is, I think that with the development of BYD and Xpeng and Xiaomi and these other EV makers in China, the future's EV already. Tesla essentially accomplished its mission. They successfully accelerated the transition to sustainable energy. They can continue to accelerate it. I think the transition happens mm -hmm. five years earlier. If Elon, if the vote is yes, Elon stays, they deploy RoboTaxi quickly. But mm -hmm. I think all of that happens within five years anyway. Mm -hmm. And so getting the world to sustainable energy is going to happen. BYD and, and CATL make mega pack class uh, battery storage devices. Um, and that's going to, that business is going to grow. So the world is going to head to sustainable energy with or without Tesla. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he has more important missions. Mm -hmm. I think that getting to Mars is by far his most important mission. And that's far from being achieved. Mm -hmm. And, um, Solving AGI in a responsible manner is a super important mission that's more important than 
sustainable than sustainable energy mm -hmm. and curing brain disease. You know, Neuralink is on the cusp of a massive revolutionary change. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. what about Nolan, Ar uh, Nolan Arbaugh is the first Neuralink patient? What about Nor Nolan Arbaugh as a remote operator? Yeah, into, into remote, remote operator. Yeah. He's a remote operator for a Tesla for a Tesla Robo Taxi. Could mm -hmm. I want to see Tesla set up to where no one can drive a Tesla? Mm -hmm. Actually, right. physically get in the car and drive himself around. Get him a Model S Plaid. So he, if he's going to have a Tesla, he might as well have a Plaid. Get him yeah. a Model S Plaid. Maybe he needs an X so he can easily fit like his wheelchair in the back or something. But get him like a Model X Plaid and let him drive around in a Model. Well, X. It, it, you know, a, a version of the um, Tesla bot could be, you know, like a exoskeleton type thing supporting the arms. You know, walking behind, I know you can that's adjust whole, it. That's a whole nother level. I'm yeah. just saying, like today, on the technology he has in his brain now, mm -hmm. yeah, could he Bluetooth to the car? Could they set yeah. up the car so that he could control the car with just a Bluetooth connection from his brain? I think they could. I don't know if he can sit comfortably in a car because mm -hmm. of his disability. Mm -hmm. But I think he could be a remote operator. Like he might yep. be a better remote operator than a regular human because he has mm -hmm. a direct connection to the computer. Yeah. He right. doesn't have to rely on his hands and a mouse. Yep, you yeah, know, that, that could, you know, add the, up the bandwidth, you know, then definitely yeah. someone could have a direct brain connection. So, but I think that all the stuff on, on, the, on the thesis is that Elon won't, uh, I don't think we'll we'll give up, and he, I won't. He won't play that game. I think that he's too stubborn to do it. Just like he was stubborn with with X Twitter, going through all the hassles they went through, tr them trying to wreck him. That he hung in there and got it fixed and and, and got it going, and then and you know saved the from going to bankruptcy. So <clears throat> the and saved free speech for humanity, right? Saved free for humanity, and then the the issue of the um. AGI aspect is that, yeah, he's concerned about control. He wants to get twenty five percent, but he can do it by by just buying the shares. He, uh, he, next year, he'll have the money to do it, right? He, he'll have he can he can get the money either you know from X or from from um, uh, XAI or from from SpaceX. He will have the means to get the money to buy back the shares if. You know, things slow right. up. I just want to address that. So it's a lot easier if the stock price falls to 30 or $40 a share than right. if the stock price is at $180 a share. Mm -hmm. And just so people understand this, I think, and you probably agree with me, that Neuralink will likely IPO next year. Mm -hmm. And I think Neuralink IPO, I think Neuralink is going to be a trend. Just the, the, the numbers are insane. Neuralink will easily have 100 million customers within a few years. Mm -hmm. Paying a thousand dollars a year, roughly, for service, and that's a hundred billion dollars a year in revenue, right? Mm -hmm. A hundred million customers times a thousand dollars a year is a hundred yeah, million dollars in revenue. Yeah, and their Starship launches reduces their launch costs so dramatically, um, and they and they may have three hundred million customers within not much longer, right? And because uh, the market, the market is that there's, I think the market just in the U.S. alone is like sixty million people don't have. Mm -hmm. It's surprising how many people don't have good broadband internet. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you're potentially looking at 300 million, million people worldwide paying $1,000 a month. Um, and when you do the math on $100 billion in revenue, and I think their profit margins are going to be close to 90% once they yep. lower the launch cost. Right. Because um, they have to, you know, the satellites are up for five years. So you have to launch a new satellite every five years and replace your network every five years. And if you do the math on it, it's just not that much. It's not that expensive. Right. So... Um, you know, that's $90 billion a year in gross profit and growing, mm -hmm. right? And then you're right. expanding services. So you are you might be looking at a trillion dollar market cap for Neuralink within three to five years. So I think they IPO at potentially $200 billion and Elon probably owns more than half of, I, Elon owns half of- you, You're saying profit. IPO Starlink, not, not Neuralink, Starlink. Starlink. IPO Starlink, sorry, did I say Neuralink? You said Neuralink, an IPO, yes. An IPO of Starlink probably becomes a, a trillion dollar company within a few years. And the IPO price is probably around two, the, the valuation is probably 200 billion. Um, Elon owns half of SpaceX. Right. So right. that would just, this, this the Starlink part of SpaceX would be a hundred billion dollars to his net worth. And if he sells some of his Starlink shares, 
Like he doesn't need to hold that many of his Starlink shares, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't need a whole lot of accelerated engineering, whatever. They're already kind of there for most of what they want to do. Yeah. Um, and he doesn't need to control. SpaceX is going to maintain majority control of Starlink. Mm -hmm. So Elon doesn't need to hold his shares of Starlink. So he sells some shares of Starlink and he generates a huge amount of cash from that. Right. He combines that with his ability. He has an unparalleled ability to, to, to bring capital together. Yeah. I mean, he's raising six billion dollars for a, a an AI startup. Yeah. That you know got like one product that does doesn't have revenue yet mm -hmm. is stunning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, I think we didn't talk about this, and I don't know how much time you have. Yeah, but, we have time. Yeah. I think that XAI has access to Tesla's real world driving data. Yeah, I think so. If you look at their one of their recent releases. You could see Rock 1.5 vision. It showed it, it, it recognized the traffic. The cars. The cars. I think yeah. they have partnered with Tesla, and and they and the deal is probably that Grok will be in the cars. Mm -hmm. The yeah. cars will have Grok. You will you will get into the car, and you'll say, "Take me to so and so." And your your voice interface will no longer be limited to open glove box and open butthole, yeah, uh, open charge board. It'll be you know you'll be able to have a conversation with the car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'll say, hey, I want to go get some barbecue. What's a good barbecue place? And well, a lot of our, mm -hmm. a lot of other Tesla customers are going to, you know, this barbecue place and, you know, so on. And, um, you know, you'll, it'll know like the top three barbecue places people are going, which one's closest, which one's likely to have a table. And it might be able mm -hmm. to get you with the answers and like that level of conversation with the car, like that's going to be unparalleled. Nobody's mm -hmm. going to have anything like that. Yeah. Um, because, you know, even if chat GPT is deployed in a car, is it going to have the same real world AI? No, it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think that there's some, um, and you know, X, <laughs> XAI at 24 billion, my opinion, massively undervalued. Yeah. Right. That's going to, that's going to be a half a trillion dollar company in 10 years, if not less. Right. So, so I think um, SpaceX has Starlink makes Elon a trillionaire next year, because even with just the 6,000 satellites that are up there and then, you know, they launched another few thousand, but they're um, higher bandwidth uh, uh, Gen 2 minis. Next year, even without um, Starship, they launched another 4,000 of those. So then they'll have, you know, um, 12,000. So they'll have the capacity of, of four times as much as the current satellites are up there. The current satellites can support 15 to 20 million customers around the globe. They're, they're getting more capac uh, capacity limits in the United States. But by selling you know, in Australia, Japan, Europe, other places, they can get um, far more Philippines people onto them. They're in the in Philippines Phil now. Phil Philippines has, and they're not in Thailand yet. Philippines has, uh, I've heard from people that there's, there's difficult to get good internet in the Philippines. Right. And Starlink is now available. And why well, that's a game changer. Right. It'll and then, then the- changer. It'll be a game changer here in Thailand too. Right. And then they're going to have, uh, so that goes to, um, they have a factory in Texas that's, that's making the dishes faster, which we saw that them increase from 100,000 per month to 250,000. So then it's the, the matter of the dishes because they have capacity for 16 million customers. They need to get, and then they'll have capacity for 60 million customers next year, even without um, Starship. So then just make more dishes, a million dishes uh, a month, 2 million dishes a month, and then they can get to 24 million, 30 million customers. Um, and also, they'll have um, high the, the business customers and the uh, military and government customers who who will pay like twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, the cruise ships, like the that. airlines. Yeah, the, the 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 high the high frequency traders. Yeah, yeah. and then they'll have Starlink's the gonna, Starlink's going to be huge. Yeah, and then they have the direct to cell phone thing with T Mobile and six other I don't, companies. There. I don't think the direct. I think people are overstating the case for direct to cell phone. It's going to be like. Limited text. You're not going to be you're not going to be watching YouTube videos on a direct to cell phone link, right? It's not. I don't. I don't want to say never, but that's not. You know, that's just to be able to text. Your five G is almost everywhere. You're, right. you're sorry. High speed mobile phone. I'm in Thailand. It's just a you know the GDP is probably one fifth of the United States per capita. Yeah. So and basically, next year access almost everywhere. Next year, that that direct to cell phone thing will give you texting everywhere. It'll give you. Um, a basic communication with one G ish uh, communication and then all and, and voice. So that means that uh, one, you have it everywhere. So you can um, uh, get rid of half of the uh, cell towers. 
uh, can you have this no, no, basic? No, no. You can't get rid of cell. It's not comparable to cell towers. In, in the remote area. I know not in the cities and urban areas, but in the remote areas where it's like, I'm not going to pay for a cell tower in uh, Mongolia, Timbuktu, you know, like in the, or, or in rural, deep rural uh, United States. Right. So you can say that. Anyway, so I no, think you're, though that. Do is you're going to deploy a cell tower that's connected to the internet by Starlink. Right. It's going to have like a high bandwidth antenna and it's going to be able to serve, you know, a thousand customers within you know within its range right i also think I that they'll... i don't think it's i think i'm sorry i just think the direct to cell phone thing is like massively overstated the, the size of the antenna on your phone the, the there's physical limit i i'm not a physicist but the physical limitations to that that application are, are very severe and starlink doesn't have to be the answer to every problem so i have i have two things on that one is text messages everywhere the short text is basically a tweet so it gives, gets you Twitter uh, X everywhere, right? Because you have the short messages. That's one. Two is um, they're going to fill out the range of, they're going to make a smaller dish that will still support um, that and be mobile so that somebody can go onto a Tesla bot or into a, a Tesla car. And then they'll make some other small mini dish thing, something that is flat that will ap apply to, to a cell phone so you can get higher bandwidth communication. Um, so it'll be, you'll have a- Let me yeah. just lay this out, okay? The, yeah. If you can serve 300 million customers with a, even a mini dish, yeah, just at their homes, at their businesses, on the cruise ship, on the airplane. Yeah. The market is so huge already. Yeah. The, the expansion to- rural customers with cell phones who don't have great internet access to give them not great internet access mm -hmm. it's just not a big enough market to matter it's okay. not like that that is so far down the list like when you have to expand to serve 300 million customers mm -hmm. we're going to pay you a thousand dollars a month for high-speed internet mm -hmm. the option of like reaching cell phone customers and getting to pay an extra few dollars a month on their cell phone bill so mm -hmm. that they can do very limited texting in those rare circumstances when they're middle of nowhere Mm -hmm. I, mean, I just like it. It's not that's that's a trivial market, but, okay. but serving three hundred million. I mean, we're it's not a really an important argument. The reality is that a hundred million to three hundred million customers paying a thousand dollars a year on average. There's you know poorer countries they'll pay less, wealthier countries they'll pay more. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be the game changer that makes Starlink so valuable. And um, I don't think Starlink's IPO makes Elon a trillionaire quite yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I do I do think by the way. I think I disagree with you also. I'm a little more optimistic about Starlink in that I suspect that Starship will be doing um, Starlink launches of the full V2 satellite. I'm going to say starting at least at, at the latest in the middle of next year. Mm -hmm. I think that they, right. are, they are working on ramping up Starship launches. And then the, the question really is, when will they start launching at Canaveral? Mm -hmm. Canaveral is the operational launch site, right? And I don't know how how much progress they're making towards launching at Canaveral, but that's the goal, right? Uh, if they can launch, but when once they're and I don't, I'm a little puzzled about that because they're building this stuff in Texas. I guess they're gonna. It probably doesn't cost that much to ship it to Florida to be launched. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're planning on doing a heavy volume of commercial launches from Starbase in the southern tip of Texas because the community doesn't support high volume launches there, mm -hmm. but. They are building a second pad in mm -hmm. Texas. They're building yep. two pads in Canaveral. Right. Um, I don't think there's any move to launch Starship from California yet, right? I've not uh, seen that. Yeah. Yeah. So. So what's what's the the California? Um, um, Vandenberg. 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 Right. Yeah, they do. So for people who don't know from this, they they do launches. The typical launch from Canaveral goes east. It might go mm. east, southeast, it might go east, northeast, but it generally goes east because mm. the earth is rotating in that direction and you get an advantage. But mm. some of the Starlink satellites need to go north-south mm -hmm. in what are called polar routes. So you can launch from Canaveral, and they do some launches from Canaveral going due south or close mm -hmm. to due south. But I think Vandenberg, for some reason, is better positioned for those polar launches. So they've been doing polar launches of Falcon 9 from there. It may be that Starship's capabilities are so great that they can just go ahead and do the polar launches from Canaveral and they don't need to use Vandenberg anymore. Um, mm -hmm. 
I'm not sure. I mean, they do a really high volume of launches from, and, and this is one of the things I don't think people appreciate is like in the Southern tip of Texas, there's a lot of people in the community who don't like the launches mm -hmm. in the Canaveral area, Melbourne area. They love it. Mm -hmm. People love it. People sit out on their front yard to watch launches. It's, mm -hmm. it's, there's no, you know, there's an air, there's a space force base. There's every once in a while, a, a military jet cracks, a sonic boom. Right. So mm -hmm. the, 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 and, and the, the landing site, the, the, where the sonic booms happen, you know, 10 miles from anyone's home. It's, mm -hmm. it's remote. It's even though it's visible, it's remote enough that the sonic booms are not particularly disturbing people. I don't know how bad the sonic booms are going to be from a starship, uh, you know, starship coming back. Might, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a bigger sonic boom than a Falcon nine. It probably is. Mm -hmm. so we'll see, but and I, I was away. I was awakened by, I, I lived really close. I lived in mm -hmm. one of the close, I lived in Cape Canaveral. And mm -hmm. I was once awakened at 4 a.m. by a, um, I think by a launch, mm -hmm. not a sonic boom, by a launch. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Well, hopefully uh, in 12 days, it'll all be good. And because we're recording this on, on June 1st, June 13th is, is when the vote uh, is, is happening. And uh, hopefully, we get good news on that because it'd just be easier if um, we just get a good, a good uh, vote and then we don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, right. Okay, well, great talking to you, um, you too, Warren. Thank you. Okay, we'll talk later. <laughs>